Uh, this is your first session at Comcast. I'm glad you chose me, because otherwise I'd be very sad. I, I thrive on attention. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, my name is Tom Hartman. Um, I am a web developer from Montreal. Um, and for the last uh, 10 years, I've been struggling with this one question, which is how do you get people to buy your clients things, right? Their products, their services, their information. How do I get more traction on them? And so for, uh, for 10 years, I've been doing uh, incrementally better, right? So you do, anyone here a web developer? Oh, perfect. Um, anyone here uh, running their own business, uh, podcast, uh, entrepreneur? Excellent, perfect. And does anyone here provide services directly to others? Excellent, right? So um, what happens is that a client will call me up, they'll say, I have this problem, I need to get more visibility, because they think that's what's going to get them uh, better profitability. Get more visibility, you'll get more viewers, you get more people buying your products. And um, if, uh, as well as the developer, you'll notice this as well, uh, there's diminishing returns, right? As you uh, put your, your product online, as you put yourself out there, you might get an initial bump as you have that sort of novelty. But you always have to like, do something in order to, to, to generate additional visitors coming to your website, additional visitors coming to your content. And um, it's extremely frustrating because um, I don't know if any of you run any social media platforms for your, uh, for your businesses, for your ideas, but it's never enough, right? You're constantly put out the next tweet, constantly put out the next YouTube video, constantly put out the next uh, Facebook update, and you're getting less and less and less and less uh, bang for your buck. Uh, to a point now where if you're not even putting money behind what you're doing, you're getting just these diminished returns. And um, it was extremely frustrating. Uh, what I then noticed with my clients then is that they were constantly calling up and saying, I have just spent $10,000 in order to, to do this, in order to gain visibility, and uh, it worked for three months, six months, and now it's not working. I have less money now, and I need more viewers than I had before. What can you do to help me? Does this sound familiar? And uh, so I ended up becoming more specialized in how do you uh, really squeeze more out of a dollar than you could otherwise. I really wanted those clients that um, you know, burnt themselves before, they didn't know where else to go to, they didn't want to quit on their idea, and I would help them um, do a little bit to get along. Now, what I was intuiting here is something I didn't realize until many years later, that um, does anyone here have any experience with uh, the stock market? No? All right. <laughs> little, little crash course here, right? So the stock market is basically like a casino, right? And so if you know uh, anything about casinos, uh, the, the idea that you can bet on what the last guy did, the last guy won on number 27 black on roulette, you bet on 27 black on roulette, it's not going to make it any more likely that you're going, right? That makes sense? Uh, but in the stock market, people think this all the time. They think, oh, if, uh, if the stock went up, uh, last Tuesday, I better get it now because it might go up again, which is completely ridiculous. That's not the way you invest in stocks. I learned that lesson. I lost quite a bit of money at the beginning doing it the wrong way. Um, what you do is, uh, what, what happens in these situations is that all these fallacies come into play. People see these winners. People see these big names. They see Google, Amazon, Facebook, what they do in order, they see them as successful. And they go, okay, we're going to abstract out what are the qualities of these successful people. And then they look at all the failures, and then they abstract out, okay, what is the, uh, the commonalities between all these failures? And then they don't do those things, and they do the, the things that the, the, uh, the big names do. Thinking that if they emulate what these people do, you will then be successful. That is absolutely not the case. Absolutely not the case. What happens is that the people who bubble up to the top have all of some of the same characteristics as the people who are in the middle and the people who are failing. It's just that you don't notice it because you're blinded by their success. This happens to companies all the time in the stock market. You'll notice Yahoo goes up and then Yahoo is gone. And MySpace goes up and MySpace is gone. Because it doesn't matter how high they go up. What's actually important is what I'm going to be talking to you about today. So we're going to be talking today about three components that works for the stock market. It works for um, uh, your own business as an entrepreneur, and it works for anyone providing services for someone else. The idea here is that you're doing the least you can do for the highest amount of return. This is called convexity in stock markets. You're trying to get one dollar that turns into a hundred dollars, as opposed to one dollar that turns into two dollars. And we're going to be talking today about value, reputation, and transparency. So let's put this into context. 
I call this not the gold bar conundrum because I learned this by through studying probability theory, trying to understand why it was that people could trade gold. How 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 do people actually trade gold? How do people sell gold to other people? Because I thought we say this all the time, something is as good as gold. So if we're comparing it to gold, how does someone go about selling gold? Is there any difficulty there? Is there anything we can learn there that I can use in order to sell um, services to the clients or make them um, sell their, their offering to other people? And it's actually surprisingly interesting selling gold. So if you, let's say for example, you got a, um, you got 100,000 bars of gold, right? You got 100,000 bars of gold. Right? Each bar of gold is 400 ounces, right? 99.99% pure gold worth about $500,000 US on the market today. You might think it would be pretty easy to sell this gold, right? Find people who want gold, here, it's gold, buy it. But first, you have to decide, wait, what is the problem that gold solves, right? The only people who want the gold is if it's solving the problem. And then you do some research and you find out that it's a store of wealth. Like if you put your money in gold, it, uh, it maintains its value over time and doesn't get affected with inflation in the way that regular dollar does, right? A dollar that you earned 100 years ago is about the same as a dollar earned today. Right? The dollar today is worth less. But a ounce of gold um, 100 years ago is worth 100 times more today because it maintains your money. So it's a store of wealth. You get uh, jewelers turn uh, gold into, um, into jewelry and they sell it at a premium. Right, so that you can wear it. And third, it's used in the industrial industrialization process, manufacturing technology. Okay, so you figure out this is these are the three uh, reasons people use gold. And then you ask yourself, okay, well, where do I find these people? Right, and you'll find yourself at conferences, you'll find yourself at uh, VRSC, you'll find yourself online, you'll find yourself at Mints, and you'll find out where these people are to sell gold. And then you might think, great, now you're off your gold, and then they'll buy it. No, right. In any situation, you're going to end up with three questions. Any question that people will ask you will boil down to this type of three questions. One, why should I buy your gold versus someone else's gold? Right? If I already, if I already have a guy, why am I going to switch to you otherwise? And how are you different than someone else? Two, they'll ask, how do I know if this is gold or a gold brick? I'll come back to that in a second. And third, why are you selling gold? Above anything else you can do, why are you doing it? These are three questions that come up again and again and again. And when you uh, speak to clients, and even in your own business, you'll notice that these questions keep coming at you. Why are you creating this podcast? Why are you in this business? Why are you creating these items on Etsy? What is it that you're doing? Why are you doing it? And these are three fundamental questions. These questions track directly to value, reputation, and transparency. So first, ask why? Should I buy your gold versus someone else's? Well, this is your value proposition, right? You have to have your pitch there. Either you might say, my gold is, is easier to transport to you than another person's, that other person's further away. Or I'll cover the cost of carrying food, so I'll store it for you instead. So if you'll save some money, you won't have to store this gold and get insurance on it yourself. Maybe you might say, I'll sell you part of the bar of gold with other people, so that you, if, if you don't have enough money to buy a whole bar of gold, you can still take advantage of storing your wealth. You can come up with all these value propositions of what you can do for gold, right? Um, there's uh, uh, interesting companies out there who do exactly, exactly this. If you want to pull up Peter, uh, this is my brother, he likes to uh, translate some of the things I say when I get uh, too ranty. So if you pull up, uh, actually the tag will put there on the, uh, open up um, goldmoney.com. So goldmoney.com is a uh, company that allows you to actually transfer your money into a bank account and that bank account stores that money in actual gold. And you get to spend it on your Interact card um, as if you're buying real money. But one of the benefits is that as the value of gold goes up, the value of your account goes up, but you're still able to spend it normally. Um, so, oh, let's go into the account here. Well, yeah, I'm do it. So, it's actually extremely useful to have uh, a service like this. This is, it's, so I don't get any commission on these companies, but I'm just mentioning them. I just really like gold, I read the TV. Uh, so I'm going to let you know these things exist. Um, so this is gold, gold um, So this is a great value pro proposition for someone who wants to buy gold. Someone who doesn't want to own a whole bar of gold could have their money in the bank account. They can transfer it out into regular dollars whenever they want to, and they take advantage of the price of gold. 
Um, there is a company called Mene.com, M-E-N-E.com. And what they do, I love Mene.com. Uh, they know that people like the idea of buying gold, but they don't necessarily want to store it, right? If you're going to buy gold and uh, you're going to store it, you're going to pay insurance costs. So they say, hey, look, we'll charge a 20% premium. We'll give you jewelry that's 24, uh, 24 karat gold. 24 karat gold. So you're not getting, you're not getting ripped off by 18 karat or 12 karat. You know that, uh, that it's pure. And what they say, uh, so if you want to go to the shop over here, you'll notice the beautiful, again, I don't work for them, I just buy their products. Uh, they have uh, beautiful items here. So the idea here is that you get the advantage of buying this gold. And you get, it appreciates over time. Uh, what's extremely interesting over here, so for example, this is my fiance over here, if you could just give me a second, give me this bracelet. Mm -hmm. So she wanted a uh, Christmas present, but I don't like buying presents. <laughs> and so instead, I bought her these, right? Now these are going to pass these around. Pay for themselves. <laughs> they just pass them on. <laughs> they pay for themselves. Because uh, Peter, if you'll open up um, tradingview.com and go to, uh, yeah. actually click on in the, open up the tab again, mm -hmm. and click on the um, global, uh, global markets. And at the bottom left, click on the, uh, on this tab, on this square. And the uh, expand window. All right, so let's double click on that. Give me one second. So if you notice over here, this is the chart of gold over the last, uh, since uh, 1998. So if you bought gold 10 years ago over here, today your gold is worth twice as much as before. So the value proposition that Mene gives is that, sure, you're paying a 20% premium gold right now. But as the price of gold goes up, you're actually covering the cost of your item. You're actually covering the cost of your present. Oh my god, I've been buying gold for all the time. <laughs> right? Why not? Right? They're ending up with something that's worth more over time. It's a no-brainer. I absolutely love it. Um, did you recover the gold? Because I'm not sure. <laughs> 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 so that's a value proposition that sells itself. So you got to work with your value proposition. We're not here for that, but you need to have that inside your uh, as one of the components. But then the next question that someone asks is, how do I know you're selling a, a gold bar and not a gold brick? So gold brick is a term that's used for uh, for con artists who would take a bar of gold, hollow it out, fill it with, with another weight, um, and close it up, and then sell it to you. And since you're not, you know, people buy gold bars of gold and not sawing it open to see what's inside. Um, they were just having this gold for years and not realized that uh, half of it is, has been taken out. Um, so it used to happen in the uh, gold rush in the United States for years, and I thought this is an ancient thing. Oh no, this happens even to this day. In the, in the uh, African gold market, you find uh, people getting uh, gold coins that are just hollowed out, tens of thousands of dollars hollowed out, and people don't find out until years later. In Toronto, from the um, from RBC, uh, this jeweler bought some gold, he went to his, uh, to a, sh a shop in order to make it, and he could break it in half, it turns out it was just made with, uh, it was mixed with something else. And it, it turns out that the uh, RBC was selling hundreds of thousands of, of, of gold uh, leaflets that might all be fake, right? So this happens all the time. So if you're going to buy gold from someone, despite how honest it might seem, you need to know, are you selling me gold bar, or are you selling gold brick, right? You've got to make that plain, you've got to prove that to the other person. And third is, why are you selling gold? Now, I have a friend who is a bike enthusiast. I say enthusiast, but he's obsessed with bicycles. You talk to this guy, he's not five minutes of a conversation, he's not talking to you about bikes. He's always dressed in bike gears. He, he's one of those guys in a blizzard outside that is on a bike. He loves bikes. He repairs bikes, he sells bikes. This guy knows what he's talking about. So the day that I needed to buy a bike, no brainer, I went to this guy. I'm gonna go I'm gonna go to the guy who's obsessed with, with bikes, who knows everything about it. Because he proved to me just in his being that this is a guy I can trust versus anybody else. Gold is, is the same way. Anything that you sell is the same way. Right? You have to know the reason why someone has decided to do that. Now, it's perfectly fine if the person says that the reason they're doing it is to make as much money as they can. That's perfectly fine. 
It's perfectly fine if they say that, oh, uh, I come from a long line of gold miners, that my grandfather was a gold miner, or the, uh, his father was a gold miner, or I'm a gold miner, I'm teaching my son to be a gold miner too. Great, these are all great reasons, right? Uh, someone might say, I'm going to uh, sell gold, and I triple gold in, in all my talks, uh, because I find it extremely useful for people to know that it's a way of safeguarding your money in, in rough times, uh, you know, that come every few years. And so it comes from a place of, of caring. I want to provide a service because I believe this service is a bill, should be there for people in order to store the value. It doesn't matter what reason you actually have, but you need to have a reason, right? You can't just be like, why is it that you're dedicating your life to do this? Oh, I guess that's what I did at school. That's what I'm doing. You're not going to sell anything that way. So I make it sense so far. Value. Why is this worthwhile? If, you're, if you don't have a value proposition, that's a no-brainer. Oh, of course, this makes sense for you to look at. Two, you've got to prove to someone that you have a reputation that says that you're not going to sell them a gold brick. In gold, what they do is put a seal on the, on the bar of gold, right? If there's a seal, what that seal says is that if I harm you, I'm harming everyone else who has this seal, the seal on it. So my harm that I do to you it is multiplied, right? So it's don't listen on me in order to stay straight and narrow. It also means that I expect to be here long term. You don't bother, a seal doesn't mean anything if you close your shop tomorrow, right? That's the implied thing. And reviews and testimonials are the same sort of thing. As people talk about your business, people talk about your offering, uh, this is a reputation moment. And the third, why are you doing it? What is your, what is your raison d'etre? What is your guiding principle for why you're doing this? Transparency. So I love this. As soon as I understood that value, reputation, and transparency is what you should be looking at in developing your own thing or to, to, to judge if what other people are doing is worthwhile, it separates all the tactics that people use in their marketing strategies into two sets. Well, three sets. We have the white hat, gray hat, and black hat. You guys hear these terms before, right? For those who don't know, white hat are all those techniques that are pure and wholesome and no one would have any problem with it whatsoever. The black hat techniques, and all the techniques that are terrible, and you find all kinds of hidden ways in order to get people to your website, in order to, uh, to gain, more, gain more visibility, because you know you have a 2% conversion rate, and if you can get that number up, you're going to get some sucker in your squeeze page in order to get your offer. And the gray hat techniques are the things that are sort of good, sort of bad, you know, what a politician might do in order to get elected. What I'm here to tell you is that gray hat and black hat techniques, no matter how good they seem, no matter how much they seem to work, no matter how long they seem to work, are all variations of con artist tactics. Every single one of them. I spent the last year studying probability theory and con artist tactics, and it shocked me to the core that for 10 years I've been doing con artist tactics. I've been, con artist tactics are confidence games. You are trying to make people see, think that the value you are offering is more than the value actually is. You try to make people think that your reputation is better than it actually is. You try to make people think that you have a guiding principle when you actually don't. It happens all the time, right? You'll have people who tweet using a tweet scheduler, right? The whole point of Twitter is that you're talking to somebody directly. And you're talking to some bot who tweeted this out because you thought of it two weeks ago and you wanted to make people seem like you're, you're busy because you're on vacation somewhere. Terrible idea. Right? We had people, we had clients who wanted to use Twitter as their customer service thing because they saw it as a blog. Top 10 companies use Twitter for their customer service and they started using it too. And someone would tweet at them because they thought they were active and they didn't get an answer until next Monday. Horrible idea. Horrible, horrible idea. You'll have things like um, uh, uh, people, I used to sit around. I used to do this for quite a while. Made a lot of money on it. I'm not happy about it. I would write fake reviews. I, would, I had a team of people all around North America who would write fake reviews for uh, laser hair removal companies. Just mass amount of fake reviews because the company has so many terrible reviews and he paid us in order to get, to get it down. And he, we, he would make $5,000 a clip every single time someone bought one of his services. So he paid me $3,000 in order to get to all those uh, uh, reviews done. Chernin, my brother here helped me out with that. I didn't do anything like that. I am not, not affiliated with him at all. It was, it, was, it was crazy. It made me feel terrible inside that I did it anyway because it was working. It was getting the visibility that he wanted. It was getting the conversions that he wanted. He's not doing so well right now uh, because people realize after a while the corruption that's there eventually gets you. Right? 
It happens to everything. It doesn't matter how well you think something is doing. If you don't actually have that forward there, it will, it will suffer. And so here's what I want to, one of the things I'm going to be repeating over the next few minutes. What you want to do is the least you can do. <clears throat> that generates the highest amount of return. So for example, I showed you a chart of gold over there, right? And so the chart of gold shows that gold goes up over time. But I don't invest directly into the gold market, right? Because if I just, let's say I placed a bet over, um, I placed a bet over here, um, and then cash out over there, I would just make, let's say, $200 per, per bet that I did, which is still pretty good, but there are other bets that we can do out there. So I do a bet, I go, look, Gold has this idea of value, repetition, and trust inside of it. I can go into a whole thing about gold, but the reason why it's valuable for so long, for, for thousands of years of our existence, is that it's proven itself to be reputable, valuable, and people know why people buy gold. And so if you know that and you invest in something like that, well, you'll never be surprised when this viral thing occurs. You'll be there taking advantage of this viral thing. And this is what people mean when they're trying to engineer any sort of asymmetrical, asymmetrical, um, virility to whatever it is that they're doing. Why you want a podcast episode to take off, why you want one of your tweets to be retweeted uh, 10,000 times. What you're trying to do is to engineer this. But what I'm telling you is that you can't engineer this. You can't plan for an increase in visibility. All you can do is maintain your value, reputation, and transparency long enough that when the timing occurs, you're there and you take off. And this happens all the time. Right? In startups, if you've uh, ever heard of Bill Grossman, he talks about this all the time in the study of the startups. He is a um, uh, very famous entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur, and he was shocked to find that it's not the idea, it's not the management, it's the timing of the, of the, of the, uh, of the company that mattered the most. In half the cases, the timing of the company. Well, the only way you can take advantage of timing, since you can't plan it, is to be around as long as possible as long as possible. So if you have a small amount of capital, you want to spend the least you can, but consistently, so that when something does take off, you're there ready to ride the wave. If you are there as long as possible for your effort, that means maybe you don't quit your second job, right? You know, I'm going all into this podcast thing and I'm going to make it work in a year. Yeah, good luck. It could happen, but you can also get, you can also uh, bet on uh, 27 black and a roulette table and see if that works. That doesn't work. The people who win at the casino are, there, are the people who are at the poker table for a while and understands how other people are playing and understands how to manage the bet. And then when it comes in, then they go all in and they ride the way up. Right? So in a year trading online, I lost a lot. And in two months after understanding what I'm telling you about, I was able to pick things that had these qualities to it that I just wait around it and they jump off. And I'm like, crazy happy today with the returns. And after I started doing this, I said, hey, wait, what if I applied this to the marketing tactics that I've been doing? How do people place small bets in what they're doing? And what I realized is one, there's some three characteristics I'm gonna give you for value, transparency, and reputation. One, value. You're providing a service because you believe you're solving someone's problem, right? Yeah. Get this within your core. You actually don't know the depths of this problem. You don't know to what degree you can actually solve it. You have to assume that the problem is infinitely deep and that you have infinite amount of work to do in order to get better at solving it. I don't know if you had this problem before, you've talked to people like this, to get an idea, right? 10, ten people, uh, of the most people that tell it to you, 10 people like it, and they go, I got something. Right? This is great. Nah, man, you're trying to get a 100% conversion rate. You're trying to get the no-brainer pitch. You're not happy with the 2% conversion. You're not happy with the 10% conversion. You're aiming for a 100% conversion. You want someone to hear about the idea of your podcast. You want someone to hear about the idea of your business. You want someone to hear the pitch, and they go, oh my god, of course I have to, I have to try it. Anyone here interested in checking out gold when they go home? <laughs> You want the pitch to be that good. Um, you, that, you, that's what you need to work on. Right? Part of your marketing is to make that pitch again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And it doesn't matter how good you think it works, if it's not 100%, you can keep nailing that. How do I say it in a different way? That requires you finding out more about the people who 
who are actually using your services. That means actually sitting down and asking them questions. I'm not talking about just focus groups. I'm talking about, I would have people sit down on the website that they built, use it. And I'd sit down for three hours and say to them, use this thing. I want to see how you're actually using it. I would use heat map um, a tracking on website to see where people actually drop off. I, you want to get as much data as possible. You want to be, you want to dive into how people are consuming your things. Really know what is this problem? Why is it that anyone would not continue with what I'm, what I'm doing? Where are my shortcomings? That's part of your marketing. That's one third of your marketing. The other part, reputation, right? You're trying, reputation is not like trust. Reputation is what have you done in the past? Trust is what, what will you do in the future? Reputation is what have you done in the past? That's why we like review so much, right? What did people say about you in the past? Not just the good, it's not just about the good and bad, but how you interact with them. Are you the kind of person that once you get the conversion that you want, the sale, the view, or whatever, that person may as well be gone? Are you one of those people who's like, as soon as someone gets the, you care more about the new Patreon subscription than the, than the old one, and someone who's been there for six months? What are you doing for them? You should do far more for them than you do for the new person. Far more, right? Who cares about the new, the new client? Make sure the old client has nothing but glowing things to say about them. Go to town. One of the things I started doing with my clients, it was a scary pitch, but I'm basically 100% successful for this pitch. I go, look, every other person you go to for your marketing services, you're going to be charged a, a set of fee plus a monthly fee, whether they succeed or not. Right? You guys have heard of this? What I try to tell people is that you give me the set of fee, which is going to be a little bit higher than what you normally give to people, but you're only going to have to pay one more time at the end of our contract. And that amount would be completely up to you. You pay me a second payment of whatever it is you want. If you think you could be, it could be zero dollars, it could be 500% more than what I did. If I brought you business, you can decide to give me a percentage of whatever you brought in, whatever it is you want, and it's up to you. One of my clients said, that sounds incredibly stressful. I don't want to have to go four months from now and sit down with you and decide what you're worth. I go, but I want you to. Because if you do that, then you'll actually have to think about what you're doing. We're actually going to have to do our best. And you're going to see that I am going to give 200% into my job because my next paycheck might be zero. She goes, that's all skin in the game. That's me who put, I'm putting myself on the line. I go, I'm not just blowing smoke. I'm telling you, I will do all this work and you can give me zero dollars. That's a pitch no one has said no to. No one does. That's basically a guarantee. Right? And in the process, I learned that I actually provide the value that I say. Instead of just moving on to the next client. Does that make sense? I'm not saying you should do that. It's stressful, but it really makes you try harder. Third thing here for uh, transparency. Now, I use the word transparency. It's not my favorite word. Corporate transparency, you guys have heard of this. And generally refers to the idea that you want to be able to see into a company, see what they're doing. Now, the only reason you want to see that is for this one reason. You want to see how is that person or that company making decisions, right? When you have a friend or a family member, if you know them, then you can know, oh, if this bad situation occurred, this is how they would probably behave. Because you have an idea of who they are, right? And that's why we want transparency. We want, will this company sacrifice my well-being now for profit? Right? You want to know how do they treat their employees because that's a reflection of how they would treat the world around them. Are they looking to build this company up so they can flip it? Are they like Uber where they're undercutting the price of all the taxi drivers so they can hack up the rate three times more when everyone starts using it? What kind of company is visible for this person or company? What is it that they would sacrifice anything to achieve? Right? This is where it plays into value and reputation. They're trying to solve this problem. They're not just trying to sell you this vitamin. They want to make your kitchen better. They want to give you time and productivity. They want you to have more options in your life. And the idea is that they are doing whatever they can in order to solve that problem. So they might take a hit this quarter, right? They might put three times more effort into satisfying, satisfying a client who wasn't happy because it matters to them to solve that, right? If someone has a guiding principle, and you know that's a random principle, and you see that's a random principle, you can be like, okay, they, they'll, they won't, they'll sacrifice this for that, but they won't sacrifice something else. The question I ask people a lot is, what would make it 
What, what would have to happen for you to quit your idea? What would have to happen for you to quit your idea? And then the person says, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's this thing I want to do, there's nothing that will stop me. My bankruptcy, my death, I will continue this to the end. That's the person I want to work with. Right? It's the person I want to work with because they will get their all. When the, when the time gets tough, they won't quit. You want a company who's willing to go bankrupt in order to make you whole. If a company says that to you, you go to them. Of course you go to them. No brain. A question. Yes. Uh, when it comes to um, companies and things like that, I can understand what you're saying. How does it relate to something that's smaller scale, like or, like a podcast, for example, uh, where um, providing value to your viewer is not as time consuming, doesn't require so much? Are you still trying to cater to th that individual who's watching that YouTube channel versus getting the new? So you're catering to whatever it is the problem you're trying to solve, right? There's plenty of people who will do a podcast because they're trying to practice speaking, or they're trying to practice their organizational skills. Um, some people are trying to get new viewers. The problem is that, let's say you're trying to get, uh, if, you're, if you don't care about getting new viewers, then you just continue to do your podcast and whether people listen to it or not doesn't matter. If you're trying to get new viewers, the problem we see with, uh, with a lot of people's podcasts is that they get discouraged when they don't get the viewers. What they don't understand is that it is, it's not really a you can't really plan on the slow game because you'll have to give up so much of what you would normally do in order to get a slow, steady stream to get, become more mainstream. You want to be niche, right? You want to be who you are. And what happens is that you just got to continue doing it until, possibly, one day, you, you gain a visibility that you didn't realize. Because as you speak, as you go about it, you, you, you end up with, as you refine your value, you, you end up in this situation where you're way better at this thing and way better at your pitch than you ever thought you would have been before. Then you have this. Uh, so, for example, my brother and I, uh, my brother's a motivational speaker in, uh, in Montreal. And um, uh, about four years ago, we decided to start doing stand up comedy. We just, uh, I started doing stand up comedy because it was all my dream to, to do it. And Peter does it out of spite because he knows that I can't stand him. It's going to be better at something that I do. And so we started doing this for the last four years. We had no idea that stand up comedy teaches you the same sort of things that we're doing over here, right? I don't know if you've ever seen stand up comedy, but if someone's on stage, if they're not funny, they're not funny. Doesn't matter what they're wearing, doesn't matter what they're doing, if they're not funny, they're not funny. And so you're constantly dealing with this world of uncertainty. What I've been showing you so far is how do you deal with uncertainty when you don't know what's going to happen? And so it turned out that doing stand up comedy for years, when you rolled it into doing motivational speaking, people were blown away. Because they would come to an event that I thought was going to be something more like Tony Robbins, and they were laughing their guts out while they were like, oh yeah, now I understand how I can be a better person and how I can be, you know, be, be, be more successful in my life. It was this weird thing that we were like, boom, put us together. But we didn't plan that, right? It's just that we did the best that we could. We saw that this doing stand comedy might make us better speakers, and it just so happened that the perfect time we came together and that that occurred. Uh, the investments that I'm talking about, I, when I see the value of reputation and transparency, I see that a recession is coming. First of all, winter is always coming, right? <laughs> Gather your, your, your food grasshopper, it's always coming. <laughs> and it just so turns out that over the last two years, it started to pick up, and where I was before, now is going to be higher returns, because I was prepared beforehand. So as you focus on what is the value here, what is the reputation, is it real, uh, is it a gold brick? And what is the guiding principle? If you just stay in that, the worst that can happen is that you fail, but you fail at doing the thing that you wouldn't stop yourself from doing. Peter has this joke he says all the time for the motivational speaking. Uh, people come up to him and say, Peter, oh great Peter, well, should I pursue my dreams, follow my passion, do what I desire, find happiness and meaning in life, or not? <laughs> it's such a weird question. Once you have your deck crystal, once you decide what I'm doing, I'm going to give my all to it, then there is no quitting on total silver. Right? What else do you have to do other than the best that you can? What other thing are you trying to live for? Just do, focus on the one thing, give it your all. Don't get it back 100%, give it 100%, and you'd be surprised at the returns you can actually get. I know that uh, you're very passionate about this topic, and like me, you don't shut up, but if anybody has any questions, I think now's a good time. Yeah. Uh, I'll just mention one other thing. So, if you want an example of a company that you can follow, 
uh, some of you want to see. Um, I find it very useful to find people who have good value, good reputation, and transparency, and follow them all the time, especially mid companies, companies that are not big names. If you go to foodblog.com, F L U E. The shoes! Have you guys heard of Fluvok? Alright, so Fluvok is fantastic. Oh my god. So, what's great about Fluvok is that every single pair of shoes that they make is particularly unique. In fact, I hate almost every pair of shoes. But then there's a pair of shoes that I see that I am just blown away by. Just blown away by. And this is the thing I want to end on. So almost everything that you do is eclectic, but you'll find one thing that you think I would never wear. So Peter, if you come out here, you'll notice. Uh, I got my brother, he said he didn't want a pair of shoes, didn't want a pair of shoes, didn't want anything to do with it. I brought him to the store. 20 minutes later, he's walking out with sparkly shoes. Right? Love these sparkly shoes. Right? My fiance is the one who got me into here. You should show me. Yes, come show me pretty stuff over here. Come on. Beautiful, beautiful shoes. I, I couldn't believe it. I love this place so much that when I proposed, Went to New York, went to Fluvog Manhattan, and, and had them put the ring inside the box, and mailed it to them from Tokyo, and uh, she opened up over there, a pair of shoes, and a wedding ring. She just, I, I love this place, right? Now, Fluvog couldn't pay me to give them this visibility, right? But one of the things that happens, this is the last thing I'm going to say, one of the things that happens is that this value, reputation, and transparency loop, what it generates is more than just visibility. It's more than just revenue. What you're trying to generate is word of mouth. Word of mouth is the only currency you want. Word of mouth turns into posts online, it turns into user-generated content, it turns into people making campaigns for you, it turns into people proposing in your store. You cannot measure the returns you'll get from the word of mouth. And you can't see it until it hits. But as you focus on those three things, it turns into this engine of word of mouth. As you focus on the people who are already there and you're trying to get from 20% to 100% or 1% to 100%, you'll notice that it generates this thing where people, when they're walking around, they go, oh, I had that problem, go to Tom, he's fantastic for it. They can't help but say the thing. It comes out of them, right? You've had this situation before. When you have a product and service that you really love, someone goes, oh my god, I have this problem, you go, you gotta go to this thing. You got, it comes out of you. That's what you wanna generate. But you can't engineer it. You can't engineer it. If you do, you're a car If you want to be a car artist, it's fine. It works fantastic. <laughs> just don't do any value transparency repetition. Do the opposite of whatever I just said. Right? If you're very successful, just do the opposite. Plenty of con artists don't know the con artist, then they try to be transparent. Google just changed their tagline from don't be evil to let's not talk about that anymore. You don't want that. Alright, so that's it for me. Do you have any questions that I can talk about? Yes, sir. Um, well, thank you. Uh, that's first of all. Um, my question is about a question. It's not for an answer. Do you recognize my question? That's my question. What it is is that everything you, that you've said, that you've described, if there's no possible revenue for following what you are really good at and doing, there's no business model. Nobody else sees it. And you know that. You just I can't make money at this, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do all the other stuff in life to make the money to do this, because this is what I cannot not do. Do you have people coming to you asking that question that, I can't make money at this, but I'm not going to let it go. Have you found yeah. these? So that happens uh, all the time. Well, not every day, but all the time. And here's the short answer to that. There is always revenue to be made. The problem is the timing issue. Sometimes the time for revenue, the, the way that it's monetized, that business model, only exists later on. So for example, when I started doing web development before smartphones, there was all kind of e-commerce things you could not do. And then when that started, like things like Etsy became, like Etsy couldn't have been a thing before. People didn't know how to do that. The distribution networks and the platform for it didn't exist. Now people are paying off the mortgages on Etsy. So what you do, the timing thing is what makes it so that this thing you love becomes successful. And in fact, those people are the best suited because they have no competition. When the thing, the time comes, they are the first wave and everyone will look back and go, oh yeah, it was obvious, but they're the ones writing it. It's a timing thing. Thank you. Yes, sir. I have a dozen questions. A fabulous presentation and you've got me, the best thing you've got me doing is thinking. Uh, you and your brother, I mean, your brother's motivational speaker and comedian, 
but going to this gentleman's question, is it's about where your revenue streams lie. Because your revenue streams are not always where your uh, passion is. And you can have revenue streams without having the, pa uh, the passion for you. You're doing something to pay off the bills. Uh, I remember a guy who used to clean airplanes for a living, but he was a mountain climber. Why did he clean airplanes? He's got free air travel. He could uh, go to any continent that he wanted to do. So sometimes we live our lives differently. Yeah, my point, I just wanted to make that comment, and the question I have is reputation management. I, I see things on television, reputationdefender.com, uh, you're talking about your reputation and working with the laser mm -hmm. hair removal. What's the best way to approach reputation? And I'll talk about politicians. We have a lot of politicians who have histories, they want to clean up their histories. What's a strategy for dealing with that? So. The, the value um, of the Trinity is the easiest thing to focus on, but what happens is that if it's lopsided, right, so let's say you have a good value and um, a little bit of a guiding light and no reputation, you end up where you can't generate this, this word of mouth and you're in this negative loop. So um, what happens is that you have to first choose a guiding principle, right? And you have to be transparent of, you tell people, I did not have a guiding principle before, I did not have that thing that guided my behavior. And you have to, now it's harder, we have to make the case of, this is why it changed. This is going to be my new behavior. And even if that leads to me no longer ever be successful, I'm still going to continue with that. Then you, you sort of get out of this muck, and you'll get a person here, a person there, of who decides they're going to be, they're going to respect that, so it will resonate with them, and then they become a part of the word of mouth. Oh no, this guy changed his stripes, you got to give him, but it's, sometimes it can take a long while to get out of it. That's why I like talking to people who are just starting their idea, so you don't make that mistake. I hate, like, the call that breaks my heart is the person who's like, I tried all these things before, and all the things were con artist tactics from every other marketing company before. So, you just gotta, you gotta get out of the mud, and it's sort of like, you know, you cheat on your, on you your gotta, wife, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta prove it. You gotta be away. And if she's upset ten years from now, well, just keep going. <laughs> this is no end. Keep going to the end. Because the guiding principle is the relationship. Sorry. I'm not sure if we're going to get kicked out. Maybe one more question. Yeah, one more question. That's okay. should be worthy of someone following that account. If you put as much effort into it that you are impressed by what you said, then it's, you won't have that wasted thing. The problem is that people, they'll put 10 minutes and think about the tweet, five minutes and the tweet online, and way more time following the tweet and seeing what people did than they actually put effort into the thing. And I'll tell people, it isn't, I used to tell people you have to tweet, uh, a post on Facebook three times a day uh, for three days a week, on Twitter, this frequency, it doesn't matter the frequency. It doesn't matter any of that. All that matters is that if anyone looked at any of the things you shared, would anyone on their own be worthwhile? And if you can't think of anything to post like that, don't post anything at all. Right? So if you have to be able to impress yourself. You have to look at that. This is how stand-up comedians with their jokes. If they're not, if I have to tell them the joke 10 times, they're like, I'm bored with it, then find the joke that 100 times you're happy with it. Now you have to go through hundreds of ideas before you find the one, but you'll notice that that one will generate, can generate a thing. You know, because you, you'll, you'll set it out and you think, okay, within the next hours I'm going to set them, within the next few days. But it could be a year from now that the thing becomes relevant. You mention the thing and now it gets picked up somewhere else and boom, it's everywhere now. Like, you don't, you cannot plan for the timing. You just have to make it worthwhile. So you put the value into your, into your thing. So, 
uh, I tell people, don't be salesmen, let's say, be consultants. When I go on, I, don't, I never go on sales call, I go, when I go meet with a new client, a uh, prospective client, I try to solve whatever problem I can right there. Because if I can't do that there, why pay me to do the thing? Put as much value into whatever it is you're doing. Yeah, that's the tension between, like, that meeting Yeah, you, you got to explain to them, too. this is where I was saying at the beginning of the value proposition, if you get the pitch right. So what I helped, uh, I used to manage social media campaigns, and at first it was frequency, because I would get paid for every post. So I wanted to get as many posts out there, or between all the stuff. And then I realized they were not being successful, or even if they were successful, they were only successful insofar as I was doing it. And that's not, a, that's not a thing that's generating anything. That's just me getting people visibility. But I would have, uh, so I'm very popular with plastic surgeons in Montreal. And one of the reasons they like me is that when they start with me, I tell them, stop every social media thing you're doing. Stop everything that you're doing. The client that you just had, that you just did breast augmentation on, make sure she's happy. Call, contact her, make sure she's happy. And after three months, she would tell everybody. And he didn't have to have some graveyard, some terrible thing where he's sharing about hats or whatever. Just stop it. But they would fight me the entire way. So I would go, okay, fine. Continue doing it with someone else. And when you're tired of it, if you realize it doesn't work, come back to me and we'll do it my way. Right? But if you, you, know, you don't have that runway, I get it. But you have to focus on the value of it or else it's really not important. Thank you very much. Uh, this guy has so much to say. This is just a tip of the iceberg. He's got to leave you wanting more, right? So visit his website, tomhartman.ca. Yeah. And thank you so much. Thank you. All right.